Good afternoon, everyone. Um, great to see all of you. Um, today is uh, July 23rd, 2018. This is the regular meeting of the Board of Water Supply. Um, the first item I'd like to take up this afternoon is um, the items requiring board action. Um, the first and only action item we have today is the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting held on June 29th, 2018. May I have a motion uh, to approve? So moved. Second. All right. Is there any discussion, any changes um, that uh, were sent out um, last week? Any amendments since? Okay, hearing none. Uh, all those in favor of, of approval say aye. Aye. Uh, all those opposed say nay. All right. Um, the minutes are approved. Moving on uh, into the items for information. Uh, the first item we have today is the update and draft schedule of rates and changes for the furnishing of water and water service. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we have uh, Kathleen Elliott Pahinui, our information officer. Uh, Joe Cooper and Dave Ebersol from CDM Smith uh, will make the presentation uh, this afternoon. Okay. Thank you, Manager Lau, Chair, and uh, Board members. Oops. Sorry. Okay, uh, just a quick recap of where we're at in the uh, overview process for uh, the water rate study. And uh, right now we're s just in the final stages of public input and hopefully board consideration at the next meeting in August. Just a quick recap, uh, as you can see, this is what we've done over the last several months. And we've probably reached close to 500,000 people with all of our outreach. That includes all the social media, the articles that we've had in the newspaper. So we do believe we've done a, a fairly extensive outreach to the community. And um, you know, obviously we will get more questions as we get closer to uh, rolling out the new rates next July. However, we will be starting and instituting a follow-up communications plan starting sometime in January where we will be explaining the changes to the upcoming tiers, et cetera, to ensure that the community understands what we will be doing. Uh, we had a stakeholders advisory group meeting last uh, week on Tuesday and they were very, again, very helpful and very pleased that we had done such an extensive outreach. We, that was one of their critical things when we were going through the process with them is to ensure that we did reach out uh, in a very broad way to the community. And uh, overall, again, the neighborhood board comments have been positive and supportive, including uh, we had a, another meeting last week and uh, the SAG members were very happy to hear that. And they have been very supportive of what the neighborhood boards have said and have also have agreed with a lot of the comments from the neighborhood boards. Again, some of the things that we did hear from the neighborhood boards and the SAG is about the sewer rates, which, you know, a lot of people would bring that up and we'd have to gently explain that that's not within our purview. And then again, the reception of the essential needs tier from both the SAG and the public has been extremely positive that we are taking into consideration people who may be on fixed or limited income. Again, the SAG uh, has strong support for the ramp up for the 21 miles of pipeline uh, that this board has also supported. It's aggressive but balances our ability to implement with economic impact to our customers, allows for flexibility as we ramp up, and it is sustainable and incremental in approach. And that the SAG members also commented, it looks like we've done a lot of vetting and they didn't see really anything to change and they s believe we are on the right track. And the final outcome of that meeting last week is they would uh, recommend to this board that the uh, water rates as presented are approved. Any questions? Members? Thank you, Mahalo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Joe Cooper, our Water Works Controller. Uh, board Chair, board members, um, I'm just going to give you a some more highlights of the advisory group. Um, we've put them through a lot. They've, um, their first meeting was in May 2015, um, and so they've attended 27 meetings um, to date. Um, and this, I think, um, 
speaks to their commitment and engagement um, on this process. Um, we have included some field trips to Halava Shaft, Hanauli Water Recycling Facility, and um, they've, it's been, um, they've given a us a lot of advisement, both um, on our water master plan as well as our financial plan and policies. Um, this is also um, just on the financial aspect. There's been 17 meetings that they've attended over the last year and a half, um, and it pretty much covers all the aspects of our financial policies, um, our, um, the, the rate structure, the rate plans, and, and our charges. And so this is just kind of, again, uh, 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 of what they've gone through in helping us develop these, um, these policies. Um, as part of this, we did want to recognize them, and we did give them um, uh, each member a, a plaque and a, a little um, another lucite um, plaque um, as um, appreciation of their hard work. And that concludes my presentation. Oh, sure yes. Did you, did you have no one who was not happy with the process? Who felt that? you either skimmed over or went too fast or didn't give you enough information or any of that? I, there was lively discussion. Yeah, lively discussion. Okay. Um, at, at times, and I, I don't want to read into anything. Um, I mean, I think they like the process. Um, are, were some of them um, may have, um, I, 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 don't, I, I don't really know. Some of them were more vocal. Um, I, I, I don't think they were really vocal against the process. I think they, you know, just were, were vocal in their opinions. Of, I just, yes. Let me just add to that really yeah. quickly. Um, we, Joe is right. We had very uh, lively discussion throughout the entire process. Did we have 100% consensus on everything? No, and I think that's healthy. That's what you want. You want diverse opinions. But I'd have to say, overall, it was near, pretty darn close to 100% agreement in most of the initiatives. Yeah, what was uh, surprising was, and we asked the question because it looks like the stakeholder advisory group had done its job, taking us from the water master plan, the capital program, the long range financial plan, and the rates. And we asked them if they wanted to continue. And I would say pretty much across the board, surprisingly, they wanted to continue to have this dialogue. Uh, one person in particular that had a lot of good, hard questions for us, Cynthia Vizentis, uh, she is just blown away by this process. I mean, she's, she sits on an environmental justice EPA committee nationally. And she's been sharing this process with them nationally as a kind of a, for her, a, a good model for others to look at. So, I, I'm, yeah, did we, did everybody agree 100%? No, and that's healthy. But in general, they, they were very uh, enthused about the process. At times when they had difficult questions, we would take the extra time at the next meeting to make sure we followed up with more information to address their questions or concerns. Okay, were there any issues that stood out as particularly troublesome? I would have to say overall, I don't, can't recall anything because we, for example, he mentioned Cynthia when we were going through the water systems facility charge, or I'm sorry, the customer charge for the meters. She asked some actually some excellent, very penetrating questions. Mm -hmm. We went back and redid our numbers and came back to her, and that was very satisfactory. So when we did get questions that they wanted more detail on, we did go back and bring it back. And usually after that second go around, generally. Uh, Pretty much they would be satisfied. And we did, all the big decisions were by consensus. So it wasn't just us talking to them and them nodding their heads. We actually did ask for them, do you agree with these concepts? And, and it was through consensus and majority. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, if I could add maybe just one area that really we told them we still gotta work on it is the issues of uh, farmers, yeah. uh, agriculture. <clears throat> And uh, because some of them are, come from an ag background, like uh, Dino Kimoto, 
uh, also uh, Elizabeth Riley. Uh, the challenges that our farmers face, especially our small farmers in our state, and, and in particular we can speak to Oahu, there's some pretty big challenges uh, before them to, to go into farming. First of all, it's a very hard job, seven day a week job basically, but also how to make it go, make it be able to sustain itself some real challenges and uh, they all felt, I mean a lot of them felt that uh, BWS, if we could get more involved in that discussion and try to help the farmers, uh, uh, we, when we got to the explaining the impact, uh, what the impact of farmers are on our water system, it's pretty significant uh, and the cost of that capacity is pretty significant. Uh, but we, we assured them that the decision, there's no final decision yet. There's still a lot of discussion, but we, we can clearly see that there needs, they need help. And um, so that's our next step is to reach out to like the State Department of Agriculture, the Federal University of Hawaii, to look at ways that we can help with this area uh, in partnering with them. Water, water supply by itself is not the final solution for farmers. <laughs> but we're one component, an important yeah. component. But we're not the only component that they need help on. Um, but so we were we're kind of committed to continue that dialogue with them. Okay. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, a long answer to okay. a good question. Okay. Any, any further questions? Chair recognizes um, David Ebersol. Thank you. So this part of the presentation then is to go through and uh, the, the rate schedules themselves. So we'll walk through, I believe you have this information on a handout in front of you also. The schedule is divided into two parts. The first is for the period starting September 10th, 2018 and going through the end of the current fiscal year on June 30, 2019. The second part is for the subsequent four years. So let's tackle the, the, the first part first, uh, as it is most like your current schedule of rates and charges. In fact, all the numbers here on this page are consistent with everything that people were shown in all of the public meetings and that have been part of the public outreach and are consistent with your current schedule of rates and charges. There's no changes to any of the tiers or the amounts that people are charged in these tiers in the first year of the new rates. So this is, all these numbers are the same as you currently do and would stay in effect through June 30th of 2019. The, some of the different, some, there are some differences, however, in what we've been calling the fine print, which is all the text that follows. So let me walk you through that. Um, the first part is customer class definitions. There's different classes of customers, residential, agricultural, uh, single family residential, multi-unit residential, and, and then non-residential and your non-potable or brackish customers. None of these definitions here are different from what the board has considered any of these customer classes to be. It's just that previously these weren't defined on the actual schedule of rates and charges and so they've been relocated to this document so that it's clear to everybody the definition of the customer classes that are shown on the preceding schedule. On now uh, on the next part of the fine print, the things here are the standby charge, the power cost adjustment, and the environmental regulations compliance fee cost adjustment. Each of the th these three <coughs> things are currently in the fine print on your schedule. Um, I would note there's been some changes to the standby charge language. In particular, the second part of the first paragraph says approval of activation and duration is contingent upon impacts to BWS customers level of service and BWS's ability to meet water system standards requirement. Activation of service will require a written request submitted to the manager and chief engineer at least 48 hours before service is required unless waived by the manager and chief engineer. And the intent here is that uh, if there were a substantial emergency and providing that emergency supply uh, 
uh, was creating an impact for your other customers, then there's gonna need to be some, some negotiation around that issue. On the power cost adjustment and the environmental regulations compliance fee cost adjustment, the change here is that the charge currently, as it's worded currently, it goes up a penny per thousand gallons for each $500,000 of additional costs. It previously said it went up a penny per thousand gallons for each $600,000 of additional costs. That change is necessitated by an overall decrease in your water sales since this was last updated, so it's reflective of the need to make those changes sooner. No other changes uh, on any of these elements. Now, one of the uh, couple of aspects that have been the subject of a lot of discussion through uh, board meetings the past few months have been the waiver of the water systems facilities charge for qualified affordable and homeless dwelling units, and also the waiver of meter charges for residential fire sprinkler retrofits. So it's worth focusing on both of these elements for a little bit. The waiver for the uh, qualified affordable and homeless dwelling units reads as follows, the Board of Water Supply may waive the water system facilities charges and new meter costs for qualified on-site affordable and homeless dwelling units up to 500 dwelling units per year. The waivers will be granted when the building permit is submitted for approval and to qualify the dwelling units must be certified as either affordable or homeless dwelling units by the appropriate agency of the City and County of Honolulu. Waiver of the water systems facilities charge will apply only to fixture units associated with the certified dwelling units. The amount of the meter waiver shall be calculated as a percentage of the number of certified dwelling units to the total number of dwelling units in the project. And if the annual cap of 500 dwelling units has not been reached and a project is proposed that would qualify for more than the remaining number of dwelling units in that year, the manager and chief engineer has the discretion to increase that year's limit. This waiver provision shall expire on June 30th, 2023. Hope is that that accurately reflects the discussion and deliberations that your board had at last month's meeting. Uh, and we <coughs> wanted to make sure and bring this item back to you for review prior to uh, its consideration in, in a potential public hearing in August. We also examined the Bill 59 that was signed into law, the Affordable Housing Incentives Bill, and uh, try to capture some of the language and definitions that were consistent with that bill. That ordinance, actually. The last item, then, is the waiver of meter charges for res residential fire sprinkler retrofits. The Board of Water Supply may waive the new meter charges for high-rise multi-unit residential fire sprinkler retrofits. This waiver provision shall expire on June 30th, 2023. That's the end of the schedule and fine print for the first year. Here is the schedule that is for the subsequent four years beginning July 1st, 2019. Again, these numbers here are all consistent with the numbers that have been shown in the four public hearings and all of the public outreach and reflects information that uh, was in your package prior to approving this going out for public input back in, I believe, your uh, March or April board meeting. Fine print, oh, I'm sorry, uh, this continues that rate schedule. Uh, including a fire meter standby charge, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about in just a moment. I'm sorry, Dave, can you yeah. back up to the previous table uh, with the customer charge? Yes, thank you. Maybe you can point out the difference between FY19 and FY20. Oh, uh, thank you for that. The, uh, prior to this, the monthly billing charge of $9.26 is charged to uh, every customer each month and that's uniform regardless of uh, the meter size. Um, that is proposed to change to a monthly customer charge that varies based on the size of the meter and is shown in the top table on this chart. And the quantity charges now have actually four, is it four tiers? Four tiers, an essential needs tier. In single family residential, it's an essential needs tier for the first 2,000 gallons of water. 
Tier two is 2,001 to 6,000 gallons, and these quantities are per month per dwelling unit. Tier three is 6,000 to 30,000 gallons, and then tier four is over 30,000 gallons per month per dwelling unit. For multi-unit residential, it's a similar structure. There's an essential needs tier for the first 2,000 gallons uh, per month per dwelling unit. Tier two is 2,001 to 4,000 gallons. Tier three, 4,001 to 10,000 gallons. And then over 10,000 gallons per month per dwelling unit is tier four. The non-residential structure remains the same. It's a uniform charge regardless of usage. The agricultural structure mimics single family for the first two tiers and then uses a lower rate in tier three to uh, eventually recover about 60% of their cost of service, which is consistent with the current uh, cost of service recovery for agricultural customers. Thank you, Dave. Um, the other change here looking at this is the movement of recycled water customers, R1 Golf, uh, R1 Other, which is all non-Golf recycled water, and then reverse osmosis, moving them to a published rate schedule. Um, previously, all of these customers' rates were determined by contract, uh, and the intent here is to enable the board to move to a more uniform structure that's consistent with all of its recycled water customers in these classes. Also the fire meter standby charge. Yeah, the fire meter standby charge. Currently, non-fire water usage in fire meters is billed to customers. So if there's misuse or leakage or things like that, uh, it, that charge does not recover all of the costs from those fire meter services. So because you are providing a standby service, those services, those fire connections have to be available and have pressure and water in them 24-7, uh, 365 days a year. Uh, this is a standby charge to recoup the cost of service associated with providing that to the fire, private fire meter services. Looking at the fine print here, this is the same as uh, in the previous year's schedule, no differences. This next page, the difference here as we were just talking about is the definition of your non-potable and brackish customers, your R1 recycled water, uh, being two categories of that. R1 golf is for those customers that use R1 recycled water for their golf course irrigation, and R1 other are those customers that use it for anything other than golf course irrigation. The reason for those differences in rates is due to the additional benefits that golf courses provide, one being stormwater retention, another being that that water is not discharged to the ocean as it was prior to uh, their usage on golf courses, and the other aspect of it is that they are in take or pay contracts, meaning if they don't use the water, they have to pay for it anyway. So those items warranted a bit of a lower rate for the golf compared to other. The last element in this is the definition of your reverse osmosis or demineralized water customers. Uh, those customers are a number of industrial users. And again, uh, the purpose here is to move uh, them off of these contracts and into a consistent schedule of rates and charges. The fire meter standby charge is something we talked a little bit about. Uh, it is for readiness to serve. It applies to services used exclusively for private fire protection purposes, including automatic fire sprinkler services connected to the alarm systems, fire hydrants, and wet standpipes. Uh, these must be protected against theft and leakage or waste of water, and no connections or usage of water for other than firefighting and system testing purposes is allowed. In addition, for any misuse or non-fire protection related water use, such usage will be billed at twice the highest quantity charge in effect at that time. Uh, that's meant to discourage people from using their fire meter uh, uh, when they should be using their domestic meter. And any such misuse or leakage, the customer shall also be subject to penalty pursuant to Chapter 1, Article 3, Section 1-3.1 of the Revised Ordinances of Honolulu. 
Except for misuse and non-fire protection related uses described above, there are no quantity charges associated with these services. So if the fire meter is used for putting out a fire, they don't have to pay for that wire. The language in the standby charge is as you previously saw. The power cost adjustments factor is the same. The environmental regulations compli compliance fee cost is also consistent well, with what we earlier reviewed, along with the other two uh, waiver charges. And that is the proposed schedule of rates with all of the fine print. Are there any questions? I have a question. Um, Dave, you know, the waiver of water system facilities charges for um, affordable and homeless dwelling units, they're expressed currently as a number of dwellings, 500 dwellings per year. Is there also a dollar amount component? Uh, no, not at this time. It's just pr strictly based on units. Uh, with the discretion, as the board requested, that the, if the last project coming in uh, requires more units than is still available out of that 500 allocation, then I have the discretion to go above the 500 to allow the last project to make it through for that year. Yes, and um, may I ask, um, last board meeting, we did an estimate. So we're looking for the 500 dwelling units. It might be about a million dollars a year. Now that's just an estimate. And what we'll be doing is reporting to the board quarterly to show how many have come in what we actually did waive. Um, so that would kind of give you some real numbers, because right now we're just speculating, just estimating. Yeah. Okay. So the number will depend depending on what types of units um, are built, whether it be uh, yeah, correct. Yeah. You know, single the, family versus multi-unit. We suspect it'll be probably more toward the multi-unit residential, but there's still maybe some single family. Okay. Any other questions? So this is uh, what we will be publishing in the public hearing notice for the public hearing to be held in late August uh, prior to the, next, the regular board meeting on the same day. Okay, uh, members, any questions, comments? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to the next item. We have our financial update for the quarter ended June 30th, 2018. Chair recognizes Mr. Joe Cooper. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, board members. Um, this is the financial performance report for the year ending, uh, the fiscal year ending 2018. Uh, our um, actual revenues were $235 million, which compares favorably with our budgeted revenues of 237 million. Our operating costs were about 20 million below budget at 171 million, which gave us actual revenue of about 63, um, or actual net revenue of $63 million, which is above our budgeted revenue of $45 million. This um, is pretty close to what we also did last year, um, is both in revenue and operating costs. Um, to break it down a little more closely, um, personnel is one of our biggest costs, um, and it was at um, $38 million, about $8 million or 17% under budget. Supplies and services was $37 million, or again, about $8 million under bu the budget of $45 million. Repairs and miscellaneous costs was $2 million under budget at $13 million. Equipment was $4 million. Utilities was close to budget at $23 million, and our debt service was about $30 million. Um, actually, if we break it down into percentages, um, in the past, actually fixed charges has normally been our um, largest percentage, but it was overtaken um, this um, year by um, supplies and materials at um, about 29% versus the 28% of fixed charges um, that um, goes into because we were buying more um, supplies and materials to um, complete our services. Um, 
The um, personnel services, um, staff salaries, et cetera, is our third most expensive at about 22% um, of our costs. Equipment is about 3% of our costs, and debt service is about 18% of our total costs. <clears throat> if we compare uh, the expenditures by capital, by category to budget, um, again, we can see that um, everything is pretty much under budget, except for fixed costs, which is just a, a tad above um, our actual cost is a tad above our budgeted amount. And then if we look at our expenditures by month, we can see that year to date, um, or for the, for the fiscal year, our expenditures are about 10% below um, our budgeted expenditures. Um, May and June have a lot of um, contracting activity for services and supplies, and that, um, actually it ramped up or um, made those expenses exceed the projected monthly budget um, in those categories. Um, and then finally, our operating revenue, again, was about, um, was pretty much on budget. It was 8%, or 0.8%, less than 1% um, below our budgeted revenue. Um, that's about $2 million, um, which is pretty much in line with um, our budget re revenue um, or our actual revenue last year. Um, revenues were down a little bit in the third quarter, in the fourth quarter. Um, and again, as we've been talking about rates, we don't anticipate a rate increase this fiscal year, um, but um, we continue to explore that. And that concludes my. Um, the financial presentation for the fiscal year. Are there any questions or comments? Any questions? Members? Okay, that, thank you very much okay, for the thank report. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, moving on to our next item, we have a review of the 2018 legislative session. Uh, Manager Lau. Uh, thank you. I'm going to have Kathy Mitchell, or she's the person that is our liaison to the state legislature and the city council, Honolulu City Council. Kathy? Thank you, Manager Lau. Aloha, Chair and mem members of the board. Uh, the Board of Water Supply tracked and monitored, monitored many bills during this uh, 2018 legislative session. This report addresses those measures that may directly or indirectly pertain to Board of Water Supply and were enacted into law as follows. House Bill 35, House Bill 634 and House Bill 635, that's Act 35 and 36 respectively, uh, pertains to Nu'uwana Reservoir 1 and Nu'uwana Reservoir 4. Um, it authorizes the issuance of special purpose revenue bonds to the Board of Water Supply to upgrade the Nu'uwana Reservoir 1 and 4 to meet uh, state dam safety standards. The, Act 35, the amount is not to exceed 4.8 million in special purpose revenue bonds. And for Act 36, Nu'uanu Reservoir 4, the amount is not to exceed $6.4 million. Another bill of interest to the Board of Water Supply as we explore our fun funding options is Act 121, House Bill 1508. This is uh, related to energy efficiency. The Hawaii Green Infrastructure Financing is a special funded program that may include loans made to government entities and private entities. Section two of this act created a sub fund within the special fund program that allows all state agencies and departments the opportunity to obtain low cost financing at an interest rate of 3.5% a year from the Green Energy Market Securitization GEMS program to reduce energy costs and consumption by installing energy efficient measures. Section four of this bill, um, the GEMS loan program may include loans to other government ent entities, and it made it broad, other government entities, so that would include the city. House Act seven, House Bill 1725, relates to collective bargaining. This requires public employees 
in the bargaining units to provide a written notification to the exclusive representative to discontinue payroll assignments within a certain time period. This bill was introduced in anticipation of a favorable ruling in the Supreme Court's case, Janus versus AFSCME. Act 7 provides a process and time frame for public employees that choose to opt out of their union membership by submitting a written notification within 30 days of their anniversary date of their initial membership date in any given year to the union. This allows the union to better manage the impact of potential resignations and for a smoother process to make modifications to the public employer payroll system. Act 56, House Bill 1932, related to emergency rules. This authorizes agencies to adopt emergency rules to account for changes in controlling and superseding federal statutes or state or federal case law. This measure allows agencies to adopt the emergency rules for immediate adaptation of Hawaii law to meet the requirements of federal law or other Hawaii law that affect agencies' jurisdiction or statutes. It still requires a public hearing of at least 30 days notice. Act 131, House Bill 34, we follow this bill. This prohibits the di Director of Health from issuing permits for the construction of sewage wastewater injection wells unless alternative wastewater disposal options are not available, feasible, or practical. This measure only pertains to sewage wastewater. It does not impact permitted discharges for other uses such as untreated stormwater, industrial wastewater, cooling water, agricultural water, and geothermal fluids. Act 17, House Bill 2106, related to, relating to environmental protection, requires the Environmental Council to adopt and maintain rules requiring all environmental assessments and environmental impact statements to consider, to include consideration of the sea level rise based on the base, based on the best available scientific data. Act 10, House Bill 2114. Um, this is related to collective bargaining. And a number of city agencies, the city, the prosecutors, including Board of Water Supply, oppose this measure out of concern that unions will not be precluded from negotiations over management decisions that materially affect terms and conditions of employment enumerated in Section 89-9D, Hawaii Revised Statutes. So if there's no agreement made between the union and the public employer, the matter over management decisions does not compel any party to agree to a proposal or make a concession, nor does it take it to the arbitration table. Act 19, House Bill 2336, relating to the employee's retirement system, uh, allows payment of the employer contributions to the ERS in advance of the fiscal year in which contributions are required. Previously, before the enactment of this bill, the ERS was not able to accept contributions in advance of the fiscal year in which the contributions are required. The contributions of state and county agencies are required to make required to make to the ERS are based on a percentage of payroll. Act 162, House Bill 2375, relating to temporary disability. Uh, this bill now permits advanced practice registered nurses to certify an employee's disability. Previously, the law only required only physicians to certify the employee's d disability. Now, the advanced practice registered nurses uh, can certify an employee's disability. It also increases the penalty for an employer um, that fails to s submit timely wage and employment e information requested by the insurer. That penalty went from $10 to $250 for each delinquency. It also allows the Department of Labor to sub send notices of a hearing electronically or by first class. If the party cannot, uh, if, if the notice could not be delivered to the party, then the Department of Labor can do the posting on its webpage. Act 188, House Bill 2377, 
relating to workman's compensation. Under section one of this act, short-term training is, um, this establishes a short-term and long-term training options as part of the vocational rehabilitation for injured employees when training for employment in another occupational field is required for the employee. Under section one of this act, short-term short -term training is defined as less than 52 weeks. Long-term training is defined as greater than 52 weeks. If training is not feasible, then self-employment may be considered. Act 49, House Bill 2651. This relates to wireless broadband facilities. Act 49 allows small wireless providers to install its small wireless facilities on utility poles or similar structures on properly, property solely owned by the state or county within the rights of way. The rights of way uh, means the area on, below, above a public roadway, highway, street, sidewalk, alley, utility easement, or similar property. Act 210, Senate Bill 2237 relates to public schools. It requires the city and county of Honolulu to transfer to the Department of Education all property upon which a public elementary or intermediate school is situated. A similar bill, House Bill 116, passed last 2017 legislative session as Act 206. Accordingly, public schools are in disrepair and a major barrier is that the DOE doesn't own the land it occupies, it's split ownership. The DOE would like to improve its facilities infrastructure to generate opportunities to improve public schools and consider other revenue generating options such as leasing, renting, redevelop, re redeveloping, repairing, constructing accessory facilities such as faculty housing. Part four of this measure stipulates that if the lands are not used for public educational purposes, then the lands conveyed under this act revert back to the city and county of Honolulu. Act 155, Senate Bill 2244 relating to workman's comp compensation requires health care providers in the workers' compensation system who are authorized to prescribe opiates to adopt and maintain policies for f informed consent to opiate th therapy. Previously, um, Chapter 386 didn't mandate a consent process agreement. So this measure is intended to lessen the potential for abuse and possible addiction. Act 111, Senate Bill 2340, relating to health insurance, ensures certain benefits under the Federal Affordable Care Act are preserved under Hawaii law, including extending dependent coverage for adult children up to 26 years of age, prohibiting health insurance entities from imposing a pre-existing condition exclusion, and prohibiting health insurance entities from using an individual's gender to determine premiums or contributions. Act 108, Senate Bill 2351, relating to equal pay. This measure prohibits pr prospective employers from requesting or considering a job applicant's wage or salary history as part of an employment application process or compensation offer. Prohibits enforced wage secrecy and retaliation or discrimination against employees who choose to disclose, discuss, or inquire about their own or co-workers' wages. Act 63, Senate Bill 2691, relates to board meetings, allows boards under the Hawaii Sunshine Law to provide a copy of the public notice of a meeting to the, in this case, appropriate county clerk's office via electronic mail. Act 69, Senate Bill 2766, relating to an employee's retirement system, clarifies the ap applicability of benefits for accidental death and service-connected disability benefits for members of the ERS. Act 45, Senate Bill 3095, relating to environmental protection, requires all users of restricted use pesticides to be subject to a requirement to report their use of restricted use pesticides to the Department of Agriculture. 
the Department of Agriculture shall record and maintain a database of all users of restricted use pesticides. It also requires the Department of Agriculture to develop a pesticide drift monitoring study no later than Je July 1st, 2019. Two resolutions were adopted. Senate Resolution Number 133 urges the Office of Homeland Security and the Office of Planning to form a Critical Infrastructure and Resil Resiliency Council in, consultation, in consultation with DBED, Department of Business Economic Development. The council shall be composed of members from various state and county agencies, including the directors of each of the county water supply departments. The purpose is to establish strategies, goals, priorities, and recommendations to enhance security and resiliency of the electric grid and other critical infrastructure sectors. The council is requested to submit a report summarizing its findings, recommendations, and the status of actions to enhance electric grid and other critical in infrastructure sector security and resiliency to the governor, the legislature, mayor, and county council of each county no later than 20 days prior to the regular session of 2019 and every two years thereafter. House concurrent resolution number 86, companion to Senate resolution 74 as adopted, is to establish a task force to expand water reuse in the state. The Department of Health is requested to convene a task force to identify barriers and solutions to expanded water reuse in the state and the task force be composed of members from various state and county agencies, nonprofit agencies, including a director level representative from a county agency with permitting or implementation authority over water use in that county to be designated by the mayor of that respective county. The task force is requested to report its findings and recommendations 20 days prior to the convening of the regular session of 2019. I should add that members of the Vai, Ol Vai Maoli, organized under the Hawaii Fresh Water Initiative by the Hawaii Community Foundation in 2013, they've agreed to continue working together as a fresh water, fresh water council to implement recommendations and to work with this task force and are committed to seeing its recommendations adopted and implemented. Is, are there any questions? Yeah. Members? Yeah. That was exhausting. <laughs> are there any of those laws passed that are particularly no. onerous on the Board of Water Supply? Either in management or in cost? Well, the one bill that we were concerned with had to do the collective bargaining. And under Section 89-9D, there were eight areas listed in the um, Hawaii Revised Statute that the union wasn't part of. They could not de negotiate and interrupt any management decisions. This bill allows for it, allows for negotiations, but at the end of the bill, it said it wouldn't compel any party to make a concession or accept a proposal. I think that was the legislature's way of balancing both interests. Um, Just to clarify, that's Act 10? That's Act, Act 10, Senate. House Bill 2114. Yeah. You noted um, two special purpose revenue bond projects. Mm -hmm. Do we use SPURBs often? Uh, this is the first time. This is the first time, yeah. Yeah, we're going to be looking at the, also the the cost of the SPURBs versus convention revenue bond financing. You also mentioned the green financing. So that's something that, that was at 3.5. That 3 seems 5. high. 3.5% uh, yeah. of interest. So we're trying to get more information on what that, what other costs might be related to that. 3.5 is actually not too bad. Um, compared to revenue bonds right now. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So we're, we'll look at the. So we appreciate the legislature uh, uh, willingness to issue authorized spurs, special purpose revenue bonds, for improving our existing regulated dams to meet dam safety standards. Uh, but we'll look at the the cost of that uh, debt. You didn't. You didn't. We didn't ask for them. Uh, we did actually request it. On the long term, 
these two projects, Muwana Reservoir Number Four and Number One, could be part of a larger aquifer recharge, potentially pumped hydro project. Uh, so, uh, getting the help of the state, uh, we thought was a good idea. Um, this this was supported by the House Committee on Water and Land, uh, representing Yamani. Uh, well, is very interested in trying to give us opportunities to leverage other, other methods of financing. So we appreciate that. Uh, the, the Hawaii Green Infrastructure Financing is something new, uh, and that gives us uh, possible access to some lower cost capital through the uh, Green Energy Market Securitization Program. Uh, so that was, uh, I think, Representative Chris Lee was one of the main proponents for this. Any other questions? These are just bills that passed. Uh, we, uh, Kathy and the rest of the staff also looked at other bills. And, and you know, during the session, there's usually starting out with thousands of bills until you get to the last part of the session. Jay? Uh, you know, the wireless broadband facilities? Uh, you know, I, I know that's more for like utilities and rights of way, but is, do we have any facilities that's going to be impacted? Uh, well, I defer to uh, the chief engineer for Department of Facilities Maintenance, <laughs> uh, who is the designated city lead for that uh, small cell uh, uh, technology. Uh, Ross? Thank you, Manager Ma. So, <laughs> the, uh, the efforts have all been directed to city street light poles <clears throat> and the utility poles that belong to some of the public utilities. And I believe within the state Department of Transportation Highways right of way, there are some areas of interest as well. So not so much real estate or facilities at, as much as they're looking at existing structures like street light poles or perhaps even uh, traffic signal poles. Although we have uh, facilities that have attracted interest of conventional cellular uh, cell towers like uh, our reservoir tank sites, uh, Nuana Reservoir Number 4, right by the entrance there's a cell site there. Um, so it could, it could expand if it wanted to also into other facilities. But our, the approach of the city is to work through DFM as the main point on this particular measure. Yeah, we've had some uh, provider contact with us. They're, they're interested. All right. Uh, um, I had a question about Act 210. I was just curious about whether or not we had any property upon which um, an elementary or intermediate school was situated. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, you. Yeah, we actually... Uh, uh, for example, I can think of one example, Radford High School, uh -huh. uh, the water, eight inch water line that goes into the school with the private fire, the hydrants on that water line are actually maintained by the Board of Water Supply. Uh -huh. uh, we have an easement, uh, so we could turn over that property and the easement to the state DOE to have them take responsibility for that and piping or uh, Infrastructure, it's actually for the school, right. school's use only okay. within the school. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Members, any further questions? Legislative update? Thank you, Kathy. Okay. Thank you for the report. All right, moving on. Um, our next item uh, for information is the status update of groundwater levels at all index stations. Chair recognizes Mr. Barry Usagawa. Mr. Chair and members, boy, that was on active legislative season. <laughs> the, the, uh, but the, the water resources are pretty much the same. Uh, no aquifer index wells in low groundwater status as of June. Our production as of June was 140, about 147 million gallons per day. And that's right on the uh, five, uh, five year monthly average. Uh, and the uh, the rainfall index uh, for for June was 94 percent. The five-year average is above normal, which is good, 132 uh, percent. And uh, the drought monitor shows abnormally dry conditions on the leeward 
Oahu. Uh, most monitoring wells are uh, showing static or declining trends as we get into the hot summer months, and we'll continue to monitor. Good shape so far. That's my report. Members, any questions? Nope. Thank you. All right. Thanks Thank you. Me. Thank you for the report. Next item uh, for information is the water main repair report for June 2018. Chair recognizes Mr. Mike Piquet. Good afternoon, Chair and, uh, and members of the board. Uh, during June, we had 34 main breaks, which brought us a total for the uh, fiscal year at 322. Um, we little less than the previous year, but kind of like running about, about the same. Um, June was a far contrast than what we had in May. To kind of have a lucky in May, but June we had 34. Um, the leak detection team surveyed 84 miles. Uh, they did not detect a leak that we had to go and repair of uh, immediately. Yeah. Any questions? Members, any questions? You know, you know that water main break on Alakawa? Uh, oh, Nimitz Highway. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that whole area is contaminated, yeah? So do you need to, you cannot just use what you already have there, or do you gotta, because it's already contaminated, I mean? Uh, yeah, the area's got some pretty heavy petroleum contamination, among other things, and maybe Mike can explain what we had to do to deal with that break, which is very unique to that location. That's very unique because there is a lot of oil contamination in the water. So we couldn't just uh, pump the water out of the trench and discharge into a, a storm drain. So we had to contain the water. We had to, we had to pump the water into frac tanks. And that was part of our challenge because uh, we had to be able to maintain a lower level of water once we started to cut into the pipe because we don't want any kind of water to get into the pipe from the outside because that will bring contamination into the pipe. So always we try to maintain some kind of water coming out of the pipe. In this case, was how do we keep the water down low so that none of the oil contaminants get into the pipe? Uh, it was challenging because we had to contain all the water, like I said. We also had to, also had to contain all of the excavated material. We had to put it into bins. And from there, we, we had to go through the process of uh, discharging it as hazardous material to PVT. And it put, put a new uh, you know, sanitized backfill? Is that what you... Uh, yeah, we, we never use, we didn't use the original material, which was uh, contaminated with fuel, and that has to be disposed of. It has to be disposed of. We bring in all our, our new material to backfill into the hole. Yeah, new base course. Uh, and <coughs> it was a very challenging main break. Uh, there was about 80,000 gallons of about contaminated yeah. water and fuel that had to be contained and will have to be properly disposed of. I would like to thank uh, Ryan Nakata of your oh, you know, work with him closely because we had some issues about blocking lanes and things of that nature. So work very closely with him. Also with Ryan because we had the uh, Vineyard Street break also where we had to close the exit. 12 inch main. Yeah, from the freeway. Last Thursday? Yeah. Uh, Friday. Oh. No, a little longer than that. Oh. <laughs> Seems like it was yesterday. But. I'm sorry, I'm losing track of these things. But. So many breaks. But Ryan was going to be out. longer, but I think it was, you, guys did, you guys did it. You finished it faster than yeah, it? Yeah, in a couple of days. Yeah. I was kind of experienced for the Vineyard Street one because we had a previous break that we left the ramp, off ramp open, and it just created a, just one bad traffic. It just backed up into the freeway. Mm -hmm. So this time we decided, to, working with HPD, that hey, we're going to close that off ramp right off the bat and keep it closed until we were done. Mm. We had to hire a, we had emergency repaving to take care of the paving as well. So we kept it closed until we got our basically vineyard back into shape. So director, we work very well with your deputy Ed Sniffen and Ryan Nakata uh, and George. also Tim Sakahara has been very good coordinating closely with them on major breaks that affect uh, busy roads. No, thank, thank you. you. I mean, thank you for the coordination because uh, we get a lot of calls, you know. No. <laughs> Even when it's not ours. <laughs> uh, so it's a team effort on the Board of Water Supply side, but also working with HPD, D Transportation Services, DOT, uh, are some of the major people we coordinate with. All right, members, any further questions? Uh, what I mean? Thank no, you. thank you for the report. And um, that brings us to the end of our regular agenda. Um, can I get a motion uh, 
to go into executive session. So moved. Second. Second. So you moved and seconded um, to go into executive session. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Mm -hmm.